On the night of October 4th, 1994, five fires were set across Canada and Switzerland. Upon investigating these fires, police found the bodies of 53 individuals who had been killed in a mass murder-suicide plot. The death toll actually rises to 56 when you count the first related murders, which took place four days earlier on September 30th. Three-month-old Christopher Dutois was stabbed in the heart with a wooden stake, and his parents, Nikki and Antonio Dutois, were likewise murdered by a couple. On October 4th, five people were stabbed and found in a fire in a villa in Morin Heights, Canada. Next, early in the morning of October 5th, a fire at a temple center in Chéry, Switzerland, led to the discovery of 23 bodies, some of whom had been shot and some of whom had been suffocated, with plastic bags found over their heads. The same morning, elsewhere in Switzerland, three chalets almost simultaneously caught fire. These chalets were found to contain the remains of 25 people, as well as the pistol which was used to shoot those found at Chéry and the incendiary devices that had been used to initiate the fires. Now, those behind these murder suicides had experienced technical difficulties with the incendiary devices, so the fires were much less expansive than they had planned. They wanted to burn all traces of information about their group, leaving behind only four suicide letters, which they called testaments, that they had sent to media sources shortly before this tragedy, to fuel a posthumous, legendary story. Because of the device's malfunction, we were left with a much larger story. This is the Order of the Solar Temple. In the following three years, over two separate incidences, 21 more members were found dead, leading to a total count of 77 lives taken in the murder suicides of the Order of the Solar Temple. This makes this group deadlier than Heaven's Gate, the Branch Davidians, and Aum Shunrico. Furthermore, unlike Jonestown or Waco, this cult was not mostly comprised of people of low socioeconomic status, but rather had members who were government officials, reporters, business people, and more. So how did this happen? The Order of the Solar Temple is a manifestation of Neo-Templarism, a tradition which takes inspiration from the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar was a wealthy and powerful medieval order whose members were arrested in 1307 on counts of heresy, with some of those members being executed in 1310. Neo-Templarism was revived by Jacques Breyer and Raymond Bernard in the 1950s, and by 1980, over a hundred Templar orders existed. The Order of the Solar Temple was led by Joseph de Mombro and his second-in-command, right-hand man, Luc Jure. Members believe themselves to be part of an elect group sent to achieve a cosmic mission. Fifteen of the initial 53 members who died were members of the Inner Circle, who believed that they had achieved this cosmic mission and were now transitioning from an earthly life into a solar body. These 15 were referred to as the Awakened, and they were among some of the last to die on the infamous night of October 4th. They died by true suicide, many of them having voluntarily consumed poison. The next 30, called the Immortals, were those who did not make this transition willingly and were instead held to it, being shot or smothered. The last eight, who were among the first to die, were considered traitors and were murdered. But what brought this group to this act of violence on the night of October 4th, 1994? To investigate this, we will look at three questions. One, how did the group outwardly justify their actions? Two, why did the group leaders decide to do it? And finally, why did the inner circle follow their leaders? The Order of the Solar Temple considered themselves to be an elect group sent to Earth and reincarnated time and time again to achieve a cosmic mission specifically helping humankind with their spiritual evolution. Once that mission is complete, the group's theology says that those elect would then ascend to a higher spiritual level. They also espoused apocalyptic beliefs, initially focused on environmental issues and the human causes of those issues. When you pair the dualistic thinking that members are divinely elected and thus superior to others with the apocalyptic thinking that also condemns existing societal practices that have allowed environmental disaster, we can begin to see risk factors for this group to turn violent. Initially though, it might have been difficult to suspect that the Solar Temple would have enacted apocalypse-related violence. They seemed more like a survivalist group. In 1986, they even published a book called Survival Beyond the Year 2000, which detailed guidelines on how to survive all sorts of potential catastrophes. So what happened? Well, theologically, the Solar Temple saw death as a transition in which the body a temporary physical object becomes separated from the soul, which is eternal. 
1990, Joseph de Mambro began talking about a transit, which is how the Solar Temple would eventually describe their 1994 murder-suicides. He described a transit as a voluntary departure, and most members didn't interpret this as talk of suicide. Instead, they mostly thought it referred to being saved from apocalyptic disaster, whether that meant moving to another geographical location on Earth or leaving in a UFO to another planet. Slowly, leaders began incorporating references to death. For example, an excerpt from one of the Order's initiation rituals, the ritual for the dawning of the Talar and the Cross, reads, Everyone must one day confront the great problem of death, which alone gives meaning to life. You must be able to die to the profane world in order to be born again to the cosmic world. In 1994, the elusive, likely made up, Masters of the Solar Temple, called the Elder Brothers of the Rosy Cross, with whom only leader de Mambro was in contact, supposedly made their transit, leaving room for members of the Order to make their ascendant transit as well. After positioning death as a way to take on their proper place in the cosmos, the Solar Temple was ready with its external justification for the actions of October 4th. Indeed, in one of their testament suicide letters, they wrote, Incarnating the subtle link between creature and creator, we rejoin our home. This assertion solidifies the cosmic aspect of their violence, suggesting that they are actors of the divine and ostensibly endowing theological credibility to their actions. But even supposed cosmic issues are generally reflective of earthly problems. How did leaders like Joseph de Mambro and Luc Jure decide that this sort of mass death was necessary for transit? Ultimately, de Mambro turned to murder suicides in an attempt to exert control and to protect the order against perceived leadership threats, both internal and external. We know that Joseph de Mambro was concerned about what outsiders thought of the Solar Temple because of his attempt to burn all information about the group. Thinking that the fires set the night of October 4th would burn his temple centers down, de Mambro tried to fully control the narrative around the Solar Temple through the four testaments he sent to the media as a form of suicide letter or manifesto. Because of the malfunction of those incendiary devices, he was unsuccessful in this attempt at total control. And ironically, he left documents and data that revealed just how important the world's view of the Solar Temple was to him. One tape found from 1994 records an exchange between de Mambro and Luc Jure. People have beaten us to the punch, you know. Well, yeah, Waco beat us to the punch. In my opinion, we should have gone six months before them but what we'll do will be even more spectacular. Part of his desire to manage outside opinions of the order was due to concerns about people working against the group. In 1993, a media story about the arrest of Luc Jure and two other order members for the illegal purchase of guns reported that several members had been surveyed or wiretapped. This left de Mambro with a deep sense of paranoia about police investigations of the group and traitors within the group. One way which de Mambro acted on his desire to control members of the order was by playing into his role as an authority figure. Charismatic leadership is sometimes seen as an essential characteristic of violence-prone groups, but de Mambro was not particularly charismatic. Recognizing himself as less charismatic than Luc Jure, de Mambro had his second-in-command deal with members on the day-to-day, -day, while he tried to preserve an elusive, mystical image for himself by isolating himself somewhat from members. More than a prerequisite for violence, though, de Mambro recognized that charisma, or at least perceived charisma, was essential for control over a group. De Mambro made himself an authority figure by positioning himself as the only one with the ability to communicate with the cosmic masters, the elder brothers of the Rosy Cross, who supposedly resided in Zurich. He confused members about internal hierarchies by playing a game of constantly changing favorites. He would tell some members that they were a reincarnation of one of the apostles, then change his mind and say it was a different member. He would invite members to witness his miracles, then not invite them again. It seems, in this sense, that de Mambro intended to keep members guessing about how to stay on his good side, how to keep his favor, such that they would almost constantly be trying to prove themselves worthy to him. Along with these changes that kept members on their toes and invested in de Mambro, he would also destabilize their connection to other members, restructuring their identities and relationships by revealing to them their previous reincarnations and then arranging cosmic marriages accordingly. 
His goal was to produce nine cosmic children, but his efforts only resulted in five by the time of the murder-suicides. One of those children was one of his own, Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel was special even among the cosmic children. Her conception and birth were highly ritualized, and illusions with lights were employed to make it seem as if her conception was immaculate. She was raised to believe that she had magical powers. In the temple, she could look at a door or window and order it to open, and they always would. Ultimately, this was because Joseph de Mambro had a remote hidden in his cloak. The reason for Emmanuel's ritualized conception and birth and her illusionary magic is that she was considered to be the avatar who would help bring in the new age. But convincing a child of her magical powers was not the only illusion de Mambro partook in, and the other instances were perhaps less innocent. Regularly doing rituals, he would use sound and lightning effects in order to convince members of cosmic apparitions. For many, this was the primary reason that they believed in Dimambro. Emmanuel was taught Templar philosophy by Nicky Dutois, who had had a miscarriage and was subsequently banned by Dimambro from having other children. The Dutois left the group, and Antonio Dutois, who had previously worked as a lightning engineer to help with Dimambro's illusions, was not too shy about talking about his role in those illusions. To Dimambro, this talk undermined his credibility and charisma. The Dutois ultimately ended up having a son, who they named Christopher Emmanuel. Offended by the gall of Nicky and Antonio to name their child after the star cosmic child, Joseph de Mambro named their child a reincarnation of the Antichrist and called for his killing, which was done on September 30th, 1994. Antonio Dutois was not the only one to speak out about de Mambro's illusions, though. His own son, Elio, became suspicious of the ex existence of the elusive cosmic masters in Zurich and ended up discovering the props that his father used to create the illusions of their appearance. When he spoke of this to other members, they began to lose faith in their leader and defect from the order. On top of this, Joseph de Mambro was dealing with kidney failure, among other health issues, including incontinence, diabetes-related complications, and possibly cancer. One aspect that has been said to distinguish violent new religious movements that commit suicide from those that don't commit suicide is leaders with serious, even life-threatening health issues. If the leader's death is imminent, there may be less hesitation about dying in a ritual religious death and bringing others down with you. In this context, de Mambro was almost desperate to gain control over his members. A recording in the spring of 1994 shows him talking to his inner group about frustrations with those he believed to be traitors, including those who had defected. I will leave nothing to the bastards who have betrayed us. The harm they have done to the Rosy Cross, that I cannot forgive. What they have done to me, it doesn't matter. But the harm they have done to the Rosy Cross, I won't forgive it. I cannot. De Mambro thus seems to have been motivated by a defensive reaction to a perceived loss of power and control over, over the order of the Solar Temple and its image. But what motivated members of the inner group to follow his suicide plan and even murder their fellow members? Members of the Order of the Solar Temple, particularly those in the inner circle, became identified with the group through their hierarchical in-group identification and intense rituals, ultimately leading to a willingness to support their leader's decision. From its inception, the Order was a highly hierarchical organization. Luc Jouret gave relatively innocuous public lectures and recruitment efforts for the Solar Temple, and those who wanted to go slightly further had the opportunity to join at a slightly deeper level, the Arcadia Clubs. An even deeper level, the International Order of Chivalry, Solar Tradition, which was later renamed to the Order of the Solar Temple, was an initiatory order available to a select few. Even within the order, hierarchy persisted. Three levels, called the Frères du Parvis, or the Brothers of the Court, the Chevaliers de l'Alliance, or the Knights of the Alliance, and the Frères des Temps Anciens, or the Brothers of the Former Times, were identified. Though the exact role of the members at these levels is unclear, it has been suggested by some that these three groups formed a secret inner group within the order with absolute authority. By passing through so many levels of hierarchical barriers to reach the inner circle, this group of members likely had very strong in-group associations. They likely also felt united and loyal to the Order by virtue of the rituals they undertook as members, including initiation rites as they joined the group and as they rose to each new hierarchical level. This is an interesting point 
given the finding that groups with highly structured methods of recruiting and initiating members may be at risk of enacting violence, potentially because of the powerful uniting effects of organized rituals. The other major type of ritual performed in the order of the solar temple was mystic ceremonies. These ceremonies might have used opera music, begun with a ritual descent down 22 steps, or have taken place in medieval robes under a full moon. They made use of the illusions created by Dimambro's light and sound effects, and occasionally hallucinogenic drugs. In this sense, the rituals may have also helped connect the members of the order with the cosmic theology and mission espoused by Joseph de Mambro and Luc Jouret. Other rituals were associated with purification, as this was an ideal the order took quite seriously. In fact, children in the order were not allowed to play with children outside of the order, and even when playing with other children in the order, kids had to wear gloves so that they did not transmit energy to each other while sharing toys. It is worthwhile to note that a drive for purification is one risk factor for religious terrorist groups. And many of their religious purification rituals involved the use of fire. Again, the five locations where bodies were found on the night of October 4th, 1994, were set on fire. And this suggests that some members may have been participating in the transit as a form of purification ritual. This is not the only ritual aspect of the deaths. In death, the bodies of some members were arranged in specific formations, like a star or a cross, which is reminiscent of a ritual. Furthermore, recall that the Order of the Solar Temple is an example of Neo-Templarism, inspired by the medieval Knights Templar Society. In 1310, 54 members of the Knights Templar were burned alive at the stake as punishment for recanting their previous confessions of heresy. The fiery deaths of the 53 members of the Order of the Solar Temple were intended to mimic these 54 deaths of the Knights Templar. Indeed, there was one more member who was supposed to be killed that night, but who escaped, cutting the death count down from 54 to 53. It seems possible that leaders of the Order used rituals to initiate a sense of unity and loyalty in the group, and that these rituals were later used, up until the point of death, to remind members of their devotion to the Order and its cosmic mission. Ultimately, this devotion was enough for several members of the inner circle to kill themselves and their fellow members.